Now, you might not have noticed it amongst all this uh, gloomy weather, but yesterday was the um, summer solstice, um, the longest day of the year. Um, but while we revel in all this daylight, I want to take you to a place that's experiencing the exact opposite, um, to the Antarctic, where it's midwinter and the sun hasn't been seen for many months. And the people at the South Pole, there aren't many of them, but they are experiencing 24-hour darkness. Um, and I had the privilege of uh, working in the Antarctic um, and uh, living there. And um, I wanted to talk to you today about some of the more curious aspects of that experience. Now, um, Angus, uh, who organised uh, this event, asked me um, why, why go to the Antarctic. Um, and I realised that one of the motivators um, came from my experiences here, where I was a student in the sixth form a long time ago, um, and I experienced um, something that might be called um, field trip envy. Um, this isn't an official term, but some of you might um, recognise it. Um, it's when um, your friends studying um, different subjects always seem to be doing something more exciting than you and going to more exciting places as part of their studies. Um, and I think this is especially true when you study um, maths, physics and chemistry, like I did. Um, things didn't get an awful lot better uh, when I went to university um, on the field trip front. Um, we did go to a uh, nuclear power station, but I really wanted to get my um, hands dirty in the wild. Um, and then I spotted a job advert for the British Antarctic Survey, and I thought, aha, um, this is going to be an the answer to my prayers. Um, uh, it uh, so I went off for an interview, and the project um, uh, for a research project, um, and it involved rather a lot of field work, a whole year and a half of it. That's um, uh, an Antarctic summer followed by a winter, followed by a summer without coming back. Um, for some reason, the Antarctic doesn't have uh, spring and autumn in its calendar. I'm not really sure why, but possibly because it doesn't have trees. But anyway, I got the job, and um, off I went. Now. At this point, some of you might be thinking, was the Antarctic at the North Pole or the South? Does it have uh, polar bears or penguins? Um, it's the continent at the South Pole, and it has um, penguins, not uh, polar bears, which makes life a lot easier and much more cute. Um, so these um, were the most common type of penguins around the base I was at. They're called the daily penguins. Um, Unfortunately, this is the only penguin bit in my talk, so make the most of it. Um, now, the Antarctic um, ha is the only continent without any indigenous people. Um, and the people have really been only been going there for a uh, hundred or so years. Um, and uh, the only people who are living there are um, researchers on various um, research bases um, dotted around the continent. Um, so really, these are the closest it comes to uh, in indigenous people. They're like little toddlers. Um, and um, I, I was there to study um, microbes, but I found the experience of human life um, on these very isolated bases very, very interesting. Um, you've got a very small number of people. In our case, um, there were just 24 of us in the winter, and you're just cut off for all um, more than six months in the darkness of winter. Um, and this was in the time before the base was connected to the internet, so there was no Google or Facebook, and they will, they will be that, that's, that'll be, the, the bases now are connected to the internet, so it's a whole different kind of experience. And um, it's very interesting to observe all the funny little habits that happen in this kind of uh, prolonged isolation. Um, in fact, this is uh, perhaps the closest you can get on Earth to being um, on a um, spaceship, um, going on a long space mission, um, which is why NASA um, and the European Space Agency have been um, studying the human dynamics um, on Antarctic bases. Um, in the 2030s, um, NASA is planning to um, send a, a manned mission to Mars, and before that to an astro asteroid, and um, obviously they want the people on the, those long space missions to be performing at their best, so um, they can pick up some pointers from um, uh, these Antarctic bases where things can go spectacularly well in the most terrible circumstances and spectacularly wrong uh, in the best of circumstances. Um, firstly, a bit about my Antarctic home. This is the um, a map of the Antarctic. Um, 
in the middle, hopefully you can, it's not very clear, but hopefully you can spot their South Pole where there's an American base. Um, my uh, base was actually quite far from that. I think if you can see the sort of pointy bit sticking out, um, that's actually going towards South America. Um, so there we go. Um, so my base was a British Antarctic Survey base called Rothera, and um, my field site was a big island just below that. Um, and this is what it looked like when I got there. As you might expect, very icy and snowy. The sea was frozen. Um, we were told not to walk on the sea ice, but it wasn't um, altogether clear what was um, frozen sea and what was solid ground, because it all looked the same. Now, you might think this is quite an extreme sort of place, but um, no, this is actually referred to as the, the banana belt. Um, uh, a relatively cushy holiday camp compared to the more gnarly places further south, which um, are more extreme in that they have colder weather and less of a view. Um, so what you might have spotted here is one of the first things you have to contend with in the Antarctic is not necessarily all the snow and ice, but a whole new vocabulary. Um, there um, is a surprisingly diverse um, range of words which are spoken. It's, it's called Antarctic English, and someone has even written a dictionary about it. Um, uh, it's also called Antarctese. Um, unsurprisingly, there are a um, number of words for ice. Uh, this is uh, pancake ice. Uh, the name speaks for itself, but these pancakes form when the sea starts to freeze. But there's also um, grease ice, frazzle ice, brash ice, bergy bits, astrugi. Other words are um, in daily use are smoko for tea break, um, gash for cleaning duty. You really don't want to get slotted. That's um, fall down a crevasse. And um, on our base, um, uh, there was uh, someone used to choose which film to watch on a Saturday night, and everyone would sit and watch a film. And that was called being on Fox Hat. And there was even a rotor for who was on Fox Hat. And I was thinking, what, what on earth does this Fox Hat mean? Where did that come from? And someone told me that there once was a hat with a fox on it, and that was put on the head of the person who chose the TV and the, the, the what, what, what program to watch. Um, the hat has uh, long since disappeared, but the word lives on, and maybe it's still living on now, I'm not sure. Um, so these words become part of the sort of daily conversation, um, such that uh, an outsider would struggle to find the hidden meanings. Um, and it's e easy to imagine that if these bases, uh, for some tragic reason, were cut off for 100 years with no contact uh, and the people survived, they would invent whole new dialects and maybe whole new languages, who knows? Um, another aspect of Antarctic life is um, there is no money. You don't need cash uh, in your day-to-day -day existence, um, which um, is portrayed by some people as a sort of very idealis ideal way to live, as a kind of utopia. Um, and in many ways, it is, um, not least because everything's provided for you um, and you don't really need money to buy that. Um, but also, there's very few locked doors, which is a very nice way to live. But um, what I observed was that um, strange currencies develop um, regardless of there being no money, with um, all sorts of weird items becoming highly valuable. Um, for example, shuttlecocks. Um, we played badminton in an unheated uh, aircraft hangar. And as you can imagine, um, the shuttlecocks didn't last very long in the cold temperatures of being whacked with a racket. So. Um, um, Anyone in possession of a functioning shuttlecock uh, uh, felt very proud of themselves. And someone could have given you a million pounds and it would have made no difference to your life at all. Um, but if you were in possession of a functioning set of shuttlecocks, you'd have felt very wealthy indeed. Um, another strange high value item was, um, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Angel Delight, that funny dessert. Um, um, uh, people used to take that away on field trips um, where the food was pretty grim, sort of dehydrated beef and things like that. So Angel Delight was quite a treat, believe it or not. Um, and um, when the supplies were running low, um, there were all sorts of suspicions that people might be taking more than their fair share. And, um, and I found myself inadvertently in possession of a high value item um, because um, um, in the winter, the ship, no ships came in or out, so you had to order your bar rations in advance, um, and then that, that your little beer ration or whatever, wine ration, was, so you shared it out with other people at the bar. And I uh, decided I would order mostly bottled beer, 
Um, and uh, most people ordered canned beer. You think that would be inconsequential, but it turned out that during the shipping process, the um, canned beer went off and wasn't very nice, or was just a bit grim, and bottled beer was um, fine. So bottled beer then became the sort of really Gucci item, and this caused me all sorts of um, moral dilemmas, because of course you wanted to share with other people, um, but I had my limited supply of little cases of beer, uh, which I knew would uh, disappear in the blink of an eye. Um, so it caused me all sorts of uh, moral dilemmas, that, which I wouldn't really expecting um, heading out to the Antarctic. I thought I'd be worrying about other things like skiing and things like that. Um, um, it turns out that this kind of thing, um, getting obsessed with angel delights, is actually completely normal in these kind of isolated um, uh, societies where you can't just nip to Tesco's. Um, um, small things can get taken completely out of proportion and uh, things which we you didn't even notice in the normal world here um, yeah, it could go get completely out of control. And apparently this is um, especially true when it comes to food, which takes on a special importance. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising to find that those people on a future Mars trip, uh, those astronauts um, get getting into a fight over jelly or something, because that's how it goes, apparently. Um, now, um, one of the reasons why people uh, are motivated to go to places like the Antarctic or the Arctic or anywhere wild is to get away from it all. And um, having uh, been there, I think it's about the last place you'd want to go to get away from it all because um, you're with the same people um, day in, day out, uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner. You have to share a room and you can't even take a walk without telling someone where you're going. It's like being in a sort of prolonged boarding school. Um, that you can't escape from, um, which, which can be wonderful in many ways, but um, it can get very claustrophobic too. Um, but it is true that it is a um, very um, geographically remote place, even if you can't really escape from other people. Um, for example, this is uh, uh, the view from the base I was at on a good day. The weather's not always like that. And, and it was just wonderful to look out on this great vistas, which um, are just completely untouched. However, that's actually not strictly true. Um, um, and I can illustrate that uh, by talking about grass. If you took a, a, a stroll around the base, um, the terrain was mostly snow or um, ice, or in the summer when the snow disappeared, rock. Um, but then you might, in the summer, come across um, a bright green clump of grass, um, which was always a complete surprise to me, because you don't really expect to see much vegetation. Um, and it turns out that this seeing grass in this kind of environment w wasn't the norm, um, but it's happening more and more often because um, the Antarctic Peninsula region is one of the regions of the world that's been most impacted by um, global warming, climate change. And um, it's rapidly changed in the last 50 years and it's becoming greener as conditions become more benign. So the irony is you're here, um, thousands of miles from any factories pumping out pollution, and yet you're massively impacted by human activities. Um, another example of that is the ozone hole, which was actually discovered in the Antarctic. Um, chemicals um, used as refrigerants um, uh, uh, go into the atmosphere and destroy the ozone layer, which um, bounces UV light, um, um, shields the planet from UV light. Um, and a massive ozone ho hole forms over the Antarctic due to um, the ozone being eaten up by all these chemicals. Um, hence, if you went out on a day like this, you'd have to put um, very strong sunscreen on. So, um, okay, there's no factories there. You can't. It looks completely untouched. But the irony is, it's um, massively impacted by um, human activity um, elsewhere on the world. Um, and the only you just can't get away from it. And the only way to get away from it would be to get on that spaceship to Mars, really. Um, so with that, I hope that I've given you a small snapshot of Antarctic life. And I hope I've also shown you that um, feeling like you've missed out on something needn't be a bad thing. Thank you. Thank you.